to go to the parks as much as possible and fishing with my dad. And, and uh, then I think probably I developed my greatest interest in nature when I was in graduate school at the University of Illinois. Uh, it was in 1954, and my roommates and I, who were all biologists, decided to go to Florida for the Fort Lauderdale party on spring break. And we went down the west coast, and we went across the old Tamiami Trail into the Everglades. And we kept seeing all of these wonderful things in the Everglades. And by the time we got to Fort Lauderdale, the party was over. <laughs> so uh, that was in the old days when there were actually places you could stay in the Everglades. They had motels and things, and we would pick up mosquitoes and put them in vials and take them back. and and see if we could get them identified. And, and I think it was the Everglades that really just turned me on. I just fell in love with that beautiful, beautiful spot. In, let's see, in 1954, it had only been a national park for about seven years. So it was even more wilderness than it is today because lack of roads and, and uh, things for the visitors were not there then. Mm. And my favorite thing, Oh, gosh. The Everglades, I think, is my favorite thing. It's, it's just uh, it, it's a wonderland. It, it's, it's one of the national parks that I guess you would say was not chosen for the fact that it had beautiful scenery, but chosen for the fact that it needed to be protected. And we, every year we go back, we've been doing this now for 11 or 12 years and lived in the park in a trailer for 11 of those, right in the park. And each year when we go back, we would learn something new and find a new spot to go to. And, and it's just uh, increased my love of the Everglades and of nature. The, the Science Mystery series actually started uh, when I got disenchanted with children's books that took them all through the process, or didn't, didn't take them all through the process, let me put it that way, gave them the answers at the end, and they never had to get involved except for listening to the stories. So I had the idea of writing the stories that had no endings, so that the children had to do some science in order to finish the stories. And uh, I met Paige Keeley and talked to her about it. And she introduced me to Claire. And uh, we decided to write a book. And I wrote one book. And then that led to the second and the third and the fourth. And each one became a little easier and to write and uh, seemed to help teachers to be able to do inquire in their classrooms when they felt that they couldn't because of the fact that they were so afraid of doing uh, open inquiry with their students that with the stories it required that the students do the hypothesizing, design the experiments, and come up with the ends of the stories. Now whether the teachers actually have the children write the end of the stories or whether they do their own lab reports, it doesn't matter to me. The fact is that they're getting involved in doing science. And that's what I think is uh, kind of unique about the books. That uh, as far as I know, they're the only stories that uh, end in the middle and don't have an ending. I, f I find out truly that, that students like are used to being told what the answer is. Uh, don't bother me with the facts, just tell me the answer. And of course, this is what teachers are trying to get away from now. And I used to have a program called What's in the Bag? And I would have someone, a graduate student or another teacher, load up a bunch of bags with everyday objects. And we'd pass them out to the students, and they could do anything that they wanted to do with the bags, except open them, and they would have to report out as to what they thought was in the bags. And at the end, they would always say, okay, now let's open the bag and find them we're right. And because I was trying to do science where you can't open a bag, I wouldn't let them open the bag. 
And when I knew I really had them invested in it is when they would get angry at me and say, but we have to open the bag. We have to find out what's in it. And uh, I would often say, well, you, in science, you can't open the bag. And that was my point. I was trying to get them to see that you have to go with what you know at this point. And when you get a better test, then you can find out more. But they finally got the point. But it took them a while to get angry. They even accused me of uh, being lazy enough to not make up more bags. <laughs> so, uh, but it was one of the most successful things I think I ever did with my, uh, with my students in, in an undergraduate and graduate uh, teacher training, was to get them to understand the process of science, which is so seldom uh, shown as a real process with all the, uh, the warts, all of the dead ends, all of the things that, the failures, the things that they don't find out. And uh, I think that's what kids are missing in science to find out that somebody doesn't wake up in the morning and say, what will I discover today and be finished by supper time and have it all done. That science is an ongoing mystery because I believe science is a, a, a mystery. And our question, our, our role is to try to find the right question to ask of science. In fact, I'll just go one step further and say that my son, who was a physician in Western Washington at a teaching hospital, is trying to work with his students who are doc going to be doctors in trying to look at their complaints as patients as a mystery, which the doctor and the and the patient try to solve together. And therefore, they, it takes a little more time, but it's much more personal. And they, uh, they reach the solution and the, the, the prognosis and what they're going to do together. And I think that's important. Mm -hmm. I think that, it, that for the teacher, one of the most important things is to get the children to be able to question their fellow students uh, with civility and to do it in such a way that no one is insulted. Uh, I usually try to teach my students to say something like, I like your study and this is what I liked about it. What I don't quite understand is what you mean when you say this. So that uh, it's respectful. And that's one of the first things the teacher does. And the second thing the teacher does is, is to listen to what the children are saying to each other. And by that, uh, the teacher is also involved in a formative assessment as well. And because the books do include a lot of, in the stories themselves and also in the writing, what we call Don't Be Surprised, which uh, looks at student misconceptions about science the teacher can pick up where those are being changed or if they're being changed and know how to move on. And the teacher does a lot of moving around and listening. And uh, one of my favorite mentors is Eleanor Duckworth from Harvard. Uh, and uh, one of the first things she says that we just don't listen to children enough. And I think these stories, and if they're, they're taught in the right way so that their children are talking more than the teacher is, the teacher has a great deal of opportunity to listen to students and, and therefore learn where the students are and try to see where the students are from their point of view. It's so hard for us as adults to remember where we were at that point in their lives. And when we hear them, it helps us very much to get back to where they were and help them to move on from where they are to the next step. And I think one of the most important things is for teachers to realize that they're not going to be 100% uh, successful in changing students, that uh, the light bulb may go off three or four years later. And they may not be there to, to see it, but to know that they have had a part in the growth of their students. <laughs>